Buckle up, because I'm coming in hot. This is going to be a crazy one. Every day, there's something nuts. You're not the POTUS. You're the BLOTUS. Wait, how long does this wall have to be? He's the most mocked man in America. That is the problem with the media. Monopolizing late night. It's hard not to feel like you're being redundant. Kim Jong-un as Rocket Man. Kim Jong-un Rocket Man. Kim Jong-un as Rocket Man. Dominating SNL. Such a nasty woman. <laughs> He's like a mine, producing raw material. <laughs> He's blowing up scripts. Oh, that's yeah. a really great job. Good. The pace of the news. Stop it. So much faster. Me first. Making and breaking careers. It's like a little kind of Churchill. Excuse me. Would you say you're on a mission to take him down? I would like to see him brought down to the ground, <laughs> preferably in handcuffs. You're turning into a real tater. Has late night gone too far? Does it go disrespectful of the office of the presidency? I think so. Let's roll! Tonight, late night in the age of Trump. November 8th, 2016. Thank you. The Late Show's Stephen Colbert was hosting a live election night special, a seemingly dream gig for the comedian who believed he'd be documenting history, the dawning of a Hillary Clinton presidency. He began the show upbeat. You don't need to chant my name. America doesn't have dictators yet. Here you have a guy, a host, ready to tell a certain number of jokes that he expects are gonna come out in the way he wants. And instead, the show starts to turn. Bill Carter is the author of The War for Late Night. So he's like in between, he doesn't know which way to go. Well, when Trump wins a state, it will turn bright orange. <laughs> Colbert tried to keep the jokes coming as the race got closer and closer. This one is a nail biter and a passport grabber. <laughs> Then, political experts gave Colbert some shocking news. Trump had taken the lead, winning two key states. The momentum shifts and his energy level drops. All the things about a woman being president, which was probably the theme of the night, has to be rejected and something else on the fly put in. Would you care for a cocktail? By the time that whiskey ended up on his desk. Here's to democracy. You knew that things were off the rails. Giovanni Russinello is a culture reporter for the New York Times. I think he was just so incredibly unprepared to greet a Donald Trump presidency. At some point it stopped being funny for him. It did stop being funny. And got downright uncomfortable when Trump went from underdog to front runner. Uh, yeah. Donald Trump has taken the state of Florida. <laughs> That's a horrifying prospect. I can't put a happy face on that. And, and that's my job. All of his emotions were on display, and it was made for incredibly arresting television, but in some ways disturbing. You're watching a guy have his hopes drain out of him right on the air. I've never seen anything like that before. <sighs> Sorry to keep you waiting, complicated business. When it was all over and the results were in, Colbert, shell-shocked, left the audience with some dark final thoughts. So how did our politics get so poisonous. I think it's because we overdosed, especially this year. We drank too much of the poison. I think there was some sort of psychological change that came over Colbert. We as a nation agree that we should never, ever have another election like this one. Do you agree? <laughs> he became a different host after that. It's The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. Colbert's harsh attacks on Trump galvanized viewers, catapulting him and The Late Show to its biggest ratings victory in two decades. Welcome to The Late Show. I'm your host, Stephen Colbert. It took him months, maybe about a year, before he found his traction. And the question was, when he ditches the conservative pundit persona that he used throughout The Colbert Report, is he going to be able to consistently amuse people and be outrageous? You, Donald Trump, are a horrible, horrible human being. By February, Colbert edged out longtime rival Jimmy Fallon when he ripped apart Trump's first solo press conference. To be honest, I inherited a mess. No, 
You inherited a fortune. We elected a mess. Colbert never let up, growing more vocal and more vicious as time passed. I have the constitutional right to say that Donald Trump looks like a rotting haystack made of meat, but you cannot. Trump gave new life to all the late night hosts. He's a human. What is wrong with this picture? Trump keeps creating the material. He's like a mine. <laughs> He's producing raw material. He's just going to look them in the camera and say, ISIS, stop it. Have you ever seen anything like this in another presidency? There's never been anything like this in a presidency. Now, we've never had this many late night people before, so we've never had teams of 10 or 12 comedy writers all writing jokes about the same guy all the time. We went into the weekend worrying about Kim Jong-un starting a war. We came out of it wondering if our president is cutting eye holes out of his bed sheets. How many late night hosts are members of the resistance? Well, it's at least two overtly. Colbert and Seth Meyers are, to me, they're like the voices of the resistance. Basically, their whole the shows are about Trump. I boldly said on this show it was a stunt and he would never really run. Seth Meyers was equally stunned on election night. He offered a mea culpa on late night the next day. Based on this pattern, of me being wrong on every one of my Donald Trump predictions, he's probably gonna be a great <laughs> president. Then he gave the new president a warning. Uh, we here at Late Night will be watching you. Myers kept that promise, brutally dissecting Trump's every move in his signature Closer Look segment. Would you call what you're doing now uh, investigative comedy? We do try to bring out information that you couldn't get out in a monologue joke. Hmm. So we try to do a longer piece where we can sort of have a little bit more freedom to explain the story. Trump is so fully out of his mind, he broke a general. <laughs> that guy's been in wars. It might be explanatory journalism sometimes. Sure, I think we try very hard. Explanatory comedy, again, I'm always, <laughs> Uh, You're afraid I'm, of the J word, aren't you? Well, I feel like it's a, I'm doing a disservice to people who actually practice journalism to say that I'm doing it as well. I like doing comedy the most, so that's what I'd like to stick with. But experts say that in the era of Trump, viewers depend on comedians like Myers to make sense of the constant cycle of news. It's time for Breaking Crazy. He's going as in-depth as he can. The line between late-night comedy and news reporting is so thoroughly blurred. Uh, people want a kind of a frontline style uh, late-night show. 2016 has been an uncommonly sh year. What viewers want, they get, and plenty of it. Thank you. Coming up, The Daily Show Descendants. So you, you were telling the president about Putin, go. So you really see a John Stewartization of late night. It was really pushed along by the Donald Trump presidency. American Legion Trump, respectful and strong. We have to get going. I sir. don't want to go. And later, the ever expanding late night landscape. You're the president of the United States. Let's go. January 10th, 2017. We have a lot of people who are sort of tasked with watching things as they happen. From 30 Rockefeller in New York. One hour before Seth Meyers taped Late Night, there was big breaking news. Breaking news. Russian operatives claim to have compromising personal and financial information about Mr. Trump. That night, Kellyanne Conway, Trump's incoming White House counselor, was scheduled to appear on his show. I had the CNN printout of that story. I made sure I understood the, the details of it because obviously it wasn't my expertise. He started things out light. He is my president. Good for you. Um, uh, he's my president so much, it's keeping me up at night. <laughs> uh, then he got serious, probing Conway about the big news of the day. I believe it said they did brief him on it. Oh, he has said that he is not aware of that. OK, that concerns me. Um, he was incredibly prepared. Unlike even some news people interviewing her, he would not let her get away with anything. I sometimes fear that the president-elect has no curiosity as to the amount they try. That is completely false. Okay. He, is, he has enormous curiosity. I'm there every day with him. He has a number of different 
meetings every day, briefings and otherwise. Uh, he was curious enough to figure out America. He knew America when many other That's Republicans did right not. That's right there, Kelly Ann. No, and Democrats did not. He did not let her slip away. I thought it was very effective. It was one of the best interviews he's done. In general, you always walk away from interviews with politicians wishing, you know, you'd pushed a little harder. Have the hosts stopped being funny and started getting too serious? It's become uh, a new brand of comedy, I think, that's both informative and, yeah, I do think pretty funny. Giovanni Russinello was hired by the New York Times to do a daily roundup column called Best of Late Night. We realized that Trump, through his own style, was redefining the landscape of late night TV. Do you think if someone watched these shows every night the way you do, they would find themselves changing their political views? No, I think that the way these shows work is they tune into a certain decibel level, a certain level of outrage, a certain um, angle of critique. The president was griping about the size of the crowd and wondering how his pink tie played with his audience. Who would you say is the toughest on Trump? Colbert has been the most savage in his attacks. I'm the most unpopular president in modern history. I've deepened America's racial divide. We are on the brink of thermonuclear conflict. It's got to be the pink tie, right? Other hosts are making equally, if not even more substantive, critiques of the president. Trump's trust in Breitbart actually goes way back. Every time we see John Oliver, once a week, they've spent a full week preparing what are essentially investigative reports. Holding up a Breitbart article does not make you seem more credible. Oliver, a Daily Show vet, has earned the rep of being one of the sharpest political satirists on Late Night. My sources talk to them! He devotes a huge chunk of HBO's Last Week Tonight to fact-finding. The press is going to be a key element in helping us sort out fact from fiction, and they are under attack. Do you remember in February, he hires a bunch of singing dancers to try to inform Trump about Putin? Pageantry for him is activism, and I think that's a part of our new reality. On my car. He's essentially being a town crier and an advocate, as well as a newfangled TV comedian. Donald Trump is acting moodier and more erratic. James Corden is a more broad approach guy, but he's done some pretty tough things about Trump. And recently confided in one White House aide, telling him, I hate everyone in the White House. Is this guy the President of the United States or a cast member on Big Brother? <laughs> I hate everyone in the house. Corden and Oliver have a way of looking at the American experience well, like, are you kidding me? This is what you people do? I'm sharing news from the White House. <laughs> the clever bits kept coming. But with so many late night stars, how do hosts stand apart? Do you ever worry about saying the same thing every other show is saying? Yeah, I mean, we think about it a little bit, but it happens less often than you would think. Steve Bodo is the executive producer of The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. El primero dos. <laughs> we said Trump was an African dictator, right? Trevor has a certain point of view and a certain style. And so even if Stevens show observe the same thing on a given night, it's still gonna come out differently. Donald Trump does not around, eh? He delivers these punches against Donald Trump that doesn't have the nastiness other hosts do. Special like important or special like the guy I made fun of? Which one? He struggled to find his voice when he took over Jon Stewart's chair. This is The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. But nearly two years later, Noah and The Daily Show were flying high. Then there was that one epic week in May. Comey is fired. If he's gone, who's going to investigate Russia's ties to... Oh! It comes out that Trump maybe leaked information to the Russians in the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. This is a trap, no? <laughs> no, it has to be. No, it can't be this easy. Come on, come on. And, and Mueller's and appointed. Mueller's appointed. Uh, probably saying to himself, man, I'm glad I am not part of this anymore. <laughs> I am just like, hello? Each night, we were just like rewriting the show almost on the fly when that happened. I was very proud of that. Trump and those bombshells notched Trevor Noah his best week ever. Homie <laughs> reminds me of every black mother. I brought you into this world, and child, I can take you out of it. Is Donald Trump the best thing that's ever happened to late night TV? 
There are certainly days where it seems that way. Next, too much Trump? He refers to Kim Jong-un as Rocket Man, <laughs> which beats the other nickname he gave him, Lil' Kim. Maybe don't make it sound like he's an action-packed new movie franchise. <laughs> Just call him Lil' Kim. Then there are also times where it's hard not to feel like you're being redundant. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's Johnny. There was only one real king of late night. Hey, we've got a real humdinger of a show tonight. <laughs> Johnny Carson held court for 30 years. But when it came to politics, he chose punchlines over political attacks, razzing presidents like Ronald Reagan. Did you see the picture in the magazine of Reagan riding his horse on the ranch with George Bush running behind with a pooper scooper? <laughs> Johnny Carson wanted to be everything to everybody. He wanted to be a, a middle American kind of guy. Bill Carter has covered the media industry for more than 30 years. He was looking for the joke of it. He would look for the silliness of it. He wasn't a member of the resistance. Let's put it that way. Well, I don't know, uh, uh, Brian. I... <laughs> My fellow Americans. I just don't know. You just remember those things, you know? Former SNL cast member Joe Piscopo took his own jabs at President Reagan. If you vote for me again in 1984, you'll receive this handsome set of Ginsu steak knives. <laughs> Piscopo said back then, late night hosts did not attack. Johnny Carson, he would always joke about Nixon. You're not going to lend me your uh, makeup man, are you? No, I'm going to lend him to Lyndon Johnson. He would joke about Gerald Ford, he would, but it was never vicious. It seems to be vicious now. The Tonight Show, like Johnny. With Jay Leno. The Tonight Show's Jay Leno kept his punches light. A lot of people think Al's popularity went up because of that kiss he gave Kipper at the convention. Remember that thing? <laughs> Leno was, you can't tell how I vote. You have no idea how I vote from listening to me. Even David Letterman, the master of stinging insults, held back. Does it bother you that, uh, that I'm always, you know, yakking about stuff? No, I'm glad you're saying my name. <laughs> <laughs> if you press Dave, he's like, what do I know? I don't know anything. I'm just an idiot who tells jokes. Welcome, welcome to The Daily Show. Great. Then in 1999, Jon Stewart, a new late night host, burst onto the scene. This whole trial is sexy. And the slant radically changed. There may be a, a woman candidate who'll be elected president watching this evening. No, not on Comedy Central, so I, I guess. Jon Stewart really changed it. Jon Stewart brought big time point of view to late night, consistent point of view. And, you know, he wasn't always liberal, but he was extremely committed to certain issues. We are, as we speak, live from our election center studios in New York City's abandoned prostitute district. <laughs> it was the 2000 presidential campaign when the show went from being mostly about pop culture to really focusing on the election. Steve Bodo was Jon Stewart's executive producer on The Daily Show. By then, the show was a political show and it pretty much has been ever since. Good news for Mitt Romney, he has uh, one tonight, and we can announce this right now, uh, most of the Confederacy. <laughs> Giovanni Russinello writes the best of late night column for the New York Times. Mulling over a certain compact news story and teasing out all the ironies of it has become the sort of the rubric for almost everybody in late night. Responding to Trump's ill-informed tweets can be a full-time job. And I know because it's my full-time job. Late Night now had a blueprint. New shows were spawning new talent. Jon Stewart is the jumping off point for <laughs> Stephen Colbert. Mr. Trevor Noah. Trevor, thanks for joining us. Trevor Noah. Welcome to the Daily Show. And John Oliver. That late night lineup exploded even more with Trump, all of them covering politics and the president 24 7. How has he changed the landscape? Just crazily changed. And Basically, you just learn more about Trump now. So, <laughs> it's really not topical humor, it's Trump humor. Are there nights where it just feels like too much Trump, where it's mm. overkill? Yeah, I think that there are most nights where it feels that way. <laughs> Kim Jong-un as Rocket Man. Kim Jong-un Rocket Man. Kim Jong-un as Rocket Man. That's not a diss, that's a cool nickname. <laughs> With so much Trump news, which beats the other nickname he gave him, Lil hosts Kim. have no choice but to I riff. I think he does a nickname thing on the same material. 
the pace of the news is so much faster. Trevor Noah! What's going on, folks? Steve Bodo now runs The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, who took over for Jon Stewart as host in 2015. Aspirants are coming together to save each other. In a way, I admire the yeah. idea. <laughs> they invited us in for a sneak peek behind the creative curtain of their show. And we watch a lot of video clips. We throw jokes around the room. I, I like that better. Then we take maybe an hour and a half to rewrite the show, tape it at 6.30 and, uh, and get to go home. That's the normal way. It doesn't happen very much anymore. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. In the age of Trump, shows are sometimes turned upside down. I now just got a piece of information in my ear that Scaramucci has just resigned. At the 11th hour. When's the last time you had to blow up the scripts? Yesterday. The Mooch couldn't make it to day 11. <laughs> the guy got fired before the job began. Being able to plan ahead? has become virtually impossible. And uh, now the president tweets again. You can't make this up. I'm loving every minute of it. Five minutes after 9 o'clock with Piscopo in the morning on AM 970, The Answer live. Joe Piscopo doesn't mind the rapid pace of Trump news. Really. It's a gift from heaven. It's a gift from God. Everybody's so upset. Oh, there's the vitriol, the hate, the divide. I am loving it. It's time for you. The former SNL comic now hosts a conservative radio talk show. I campaigned in Florida. I spoke at a Trump Pence rally. I know Donald like 25 years, man, okay? As someone who voted for Trump, you don't get angry at the, the jokes, all, all the attacks from late night comics the way that others do. No. Does it go too far? It does go too far. Does it go disrespectful of the office of the presidency of the United States? I think so. Let me read this presidential briefing. Yep, yeah, I got the president, I got the briefing right here. Next, how far is too far? Late night goes off the rails. You're the president, but you're turning into a real dictator. Good evening from Hofstra University. I'm Lester Holt. It's debate night on SNL, October 2016. This was Alec Baldwin's debut as Donald Trump. Our jobs are fleeing this country. They're going to Mexico. They're going to China. <laughs> That'll stop that. If Hillary knew how, she would have done it already, period. End of story. I won the debate. I stayed calm, just like I promised. And it is over. Good night, Hofstra. Baldwin was winging it. Later, he told The Late Show's Stephen Colbert that the first time he tried out Trump was during his SNL dress rehearsal. It's totally a caricature. You know, you just pick a few things. Like, I'm sitting in the room, I'm going, you know, left eyebrow up, right eyebrow down, shove your face out, you're trying to suck the chrome off the fender of a car. You're like... Mr. Trump, two more minutes. The thing about the blacks... <laughs> As he sparred with Kate McKinnon's hilarious Hillary Clinton, viewers ate it up. This man is clearly unfit to be commander in chief. Wrong. He is a bully. Shut up. He started the birther movement. You did. After that night, Baldwin's rendition of Trump was forever cemented in America's psyche. And number four. Wrong. <laughs> Saturday Night Live now has a permanent character. They always had presidents, but this is now this, you know, iconic Saturday Night Live character. Send in Steve Bannon. Members of Trump's team gave SNL even more red meat. No! Kate McKinnon stole the show as Trump's overworked campaign manager, Kellyanne Conway. Apology. <laughs> Do you want a drink? Jesus. And post-election, Kate's impersonation of an unhinged Conway trying to win over CNN's Jake Tapper... I'm not going to be ignored. <laughs> ...gave SNL's version of Fatal Attraction another hit. I'm here to swallow gum, and I'm here to take Nate! Comedian Melissa McCarthy struck comedy gold as press secretary Sean Spicy Spicer. And our president will not... <laughs> Turd. <laughs> Driving his podium into the press. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> A lot of it is just funny, and again, all credit goes to Trump for that. He sets that up. It's Saturday Night Live. 
Trump gave SNL a record-shattering season. Come on over here to daddy. <laughs> and brought Baldwin back for another round. The president of the United States. SNL has historically always gone after presidents. Hey, hold on, Harry, why so tense? <laughs> Arguably, no one did a better Ronald Reagan than comic Joe Piscopo. I think Alec Baldwin is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Folks get upset when they see Alec Baldwin portray Donald Trump, but you know what I learned, man? You don't cut funny. And mm. if it's funny, you got it's gonna it's gonna hurt. But you gotta have a sense of humor about it. So know? Trump should embrace these caricatures. Absolutely. Donald Trump should invite Alec Baldwin to the White House. But so far, Trump's not laughing. After Baldwin's debut, the president hate-tweeted his disdain. Just tried watching SNL. Unwatchable, totally biased, not funny, and the Baldwin impersonation just can't get any worse. Sad. I do miss my old life. We all do, sir. As the Trump jokes escalated, the president's distaste for late night intensified. You attract more skinheads than free Rogaine. <laughs> In May, The Late Show's Stephen Colbert found himself in hot water when he blasted Trump in an over-the-top, profanity-laden meltdown. The only thing your mouth is good for is being Vladimir Putin's <laughs> holster. <laughs> His tirade sparked a firestorm in the press and fueled a hashtag Fire Colbert campaign on Twitter. Trump did not respond right away. Trump was obviously restrained for about the first six months of his presidency. But days after the attack, the president surfaced, condemning Colbert in a Time Magazine interview, saying, quote, you see a no-talent guy like Colbert? There's nothing funny about what he says. He was probably watching these shows and probably feeling offended every night. At that moment, we realized that he couldn't take it anymore. The only thing smaller than your hands is your tax returns. Trump went on, slamming Colbert over his improved ratings. The guy was dying. By the way, they were going to take him off television. Then he started attacking me, and he started doing better. <laughs> Colbert's response was, to say the least, effusive. The President of the United States <laughs> has personally come after me and my show. And there's only one thing to say. <laughs> I think when Trump tweets about one of these shows, they probably have a party. They must love that because that means they're scoring points. Months later, Trump took aim at Late Night again, tweeting, Late Night hosts are dealing with the Democrats for their very unfunny and repetitive material. Always anti-Trump. Should we get equal time? It did not take long for a Late Night retort. Jimmy Kimmel tweeted, Excellent point, Mr. President. You should quit that boring job. I'll let you have my show all to yourself. The Trump versus late night war rages on. So we put the baby in an ambulance. Coming up, crossing the line from satire to activism. If your baby is going to die and it doesn't have to, it, it shouldn't matter how much money you make. I have something to say here, Donald Trump, if you're watching, first of all, you're a bad president, please resign. Second of all... In the Trump era, The Late Show's Stephen Colbert's satirical voice cracked the code. But Colbert's method of madness is in sharp contrast to what, not long ago, was a winning formula on NBC's The Tonight Show. Wow, I look fantastic. Jimmy is he does an impression of Trump a very good impression of Trump all right me we've got a big interview with Jimmy Fallon coming up but let's be honest Fallon's a lightweight no way he deserves to interview me the only one qualified to interview me is me Bill Carter is the author of The Late Shift he doesn't want to be in the mix of this is my point of view and you know I'm pounding away at the president he knows it's not his strength he doesn't want to do it. I hope they're going to understand. Just months before the election, Jimmy Fallon was vilified for being too soft on Trump. His ratings suffered. <laughs> yes! 
Was interviewing Trump and playing with him a big deal? Was it actually a big deal? Giovanni Russinello is a culture reporter for the New York Times. I think he's acknowledged since then that yes, it was a huge deal and that he's, he was surprised by the kind of blowback that he got, but he has to reckon with it. Today, Trump said he believes in torturing prisoners, which is bad news for Melania, and... <laughs> Like Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel stuck to a more traditional show on ABC. He's sort of like your all-American 1950s guy. He's not especially progressive in his social views, in my opinion. I don't think of him like out there to, to bash conservatives. That persona changed last May. So now more when Kimmel, through tears, revealed a health scare involving his newborn son. It's, it's a terrifying thing. I'm, uh, you know, my wife is back in the uh, recovery room. She has no idea what's going on. Kimmel's emotional story became a call to action on health care. If your baby is going to die, and it doesn't have to, it, it shouldn't matter how much money you make. That, I think that's something that, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or something else, we all agree on that, right? I mean, we do. He puts himself out there in the middle of the health care discussion. I think he really zeroed in on that, and, and it's kind of made him, you know, a heroic figure for some people. <laughs> Then, Kimmel was fully immersed in the political fray when he had on the Louisiana senator who was making a last-ditch effort to pass a new health reform bill. The Jimmy Kimmel test, I think, should be no family should be denied medical care, emergency or otherwise, because they can't afford it. Can that be the Jimmy Kimmel test? Is that oversimplifying it? Hey, man, you're on the right track. And if that's as close as we can get, that works great in government. Now, we've got to be able to pay for it. And that's the challenge. I can think of a way to pay for it is don't give a huge tax cut to millionaires like me and instead leave it how it is. I mean, that, that would be one way. Months later, in September, Kimmel went on a three-night tirade, announcing that Cassidy's proposed Jimmy Kimmel test failed. And this guy, Bill Cassidy, just lied right to my face. They continued to duke it out when the senator said Kimmel didn't understand the bill. Could it be, Senator Cassidy, that the problem is that I do understand and you got caught with your G.O. penis out? Is that possible? Kimmel didn't let up. I don't want to turn this into a Kanye and Taylor Swift type situation. This time, calling out Trump. There's no way President Trump read this bill. The Democrats should just rename it Ivanka Care. Guaranteed he gets on board. Kimmel is not a political actor by nature, but the entire sphere of late night has become so politicized that it's almost within my job description now. As Trump's wild ride continued, Jimmy Fallon was pulled in too. It was the horrible events in Charlottesville, Virginia that provoked him. Even though The Tonight Show isn't a political show, it's my responsibility to stand up against intolerance and extremism as a human being. What happened over the weekend in Charlottesville, Virginia was just disgusting. The fact that it took the president two days to come out and clearly denounce racist and white supremacists is shameful. It was a moment when the gloves came off. I think even Fallon said this is no way for a president to act and that he needs to apologize. Do you think he was reluctant to do this? I felt like his, I felt like his mode of delivery was strange. It's important for everyone. It just made me think, oh, he's just this country, telling this like he tells his jokes. This. Ignoring it is just as bad as supporting it. So Kimmel is still mining that divide between am I the all-American guy or am I the critic? It's one that Fallon has decisively sort of advocated that, that, that choice. He said, I'm not going to even budge. Fallon ditched the hair messing but continued the Trump mocking. Buckle up, because I'm coming in hot. This is going to be a crazy one. Daddy came to play. <laughs> I think when you look at the 1130 shows, they're different kinds of television shows. If you were a better president... Some people want to turn on late night shows and they want to see hard takes on politics and other people use it for escapism. And I think it's important that those shows still exist. Oh, this made me laugh. And I think Jimmy does that better than anybody. Coming up... The new faces of late night. I won't deport you. Do you hear me now? Yes, we will. What's wrong? I hold my breath for a very long time. 
The ritual is a labor of love for comedian Anthony Ataminen. He's transforming into President Trump. Let's roll! Atamanik is the breakout star of a show unlike anything else on TV. Comedy Central's The President Show imagines Donald Trump hosting his own late night series. I turned the Oval Office into a classic late night set. Anthony channels a darker version of Trump. Who is the person you hate? <laughs> it is me. What did you figure out early on about playing him? He has a sort of like a like an animal thing with his jaw where he's like. He pushes his jaw forward and does this Mussolini sort of turn. That's what? That's what else? Anthony got his start in New York's improv clubs. We would never plagiarize Michelle Obama. Which is where he talk. realized he did a pretty good Trump. Sorry, You're performing at UCB, then yeah. you pitch this show to Comedy Central. Yeah. The pitch was Donald Trump is bored at the White House, but he does, he always wanted his TV show. I think it's important to let the audience know who's being nice and who's being not nice. The president of the United States. The president show was born. I'm the president. Can you believe it? Airing once a week. I went to your wedding to Marla. It looks like a real late night talk show with celebrity guests <laughs> and banter with Trump's sidekick. VP Mike Pence. You know what? Get out of here. No. Get him out. I don't want to talk to you either. Get him out of but here. Sir. What we've tried to do is turn them into sort of a dark version of Abbott and Costello. Like art imitating life, others in Anthony's Trump administration have had short runs. <laughs> like chief strategist Steve Bannon. Who put that door in the doorway? You guys heard me in the front, though, right? What, what I say, John? And his infamous White House communications director. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so good with it being short because I don't want to step out on stage in a concert stage and have people yelling, out, do the mooch. Anthony Scaramucci. Played by Sex and the City actor Mario Cantone. Ooh, 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 Snap out of it. The real fun begins when POTUS leaves the studio for improvised this sketches. This is really terrible. What are we, off-roading? There you go, wonderful. Yeah, that worked perfect. out great. In one popular segment, Anthony's Trump. It's all changed. This is not like the old neighborhood at all. Visits his childhood home in Queens, New York. It's a beautiful neighborhood. What an awful block. Why this did you decide to bring your character here? Um, I always wanted to do the roots of Trump. My version of him is like uh, uh, sort of petulant and like always rejecting his past. This is where Donald Trump was born. Okay, I don't need my own biography, Mike. The formula worked. The show has vaulted to the top of Comedy Central's ratings. This demand for Trump humor brought another comic to an unexpected place. I would never think to watch a late night show on Netflix on a daily basis because that's not what it does. But it's interesting that she landed there. Chelsea Handler landed Netflix's first ever talk show, Chelsea. Donald Trump, monkeys. <laughs> Viewers binged her outrageous rant. A little place I like to call monkey business. <laughs> About her least favorite person. How much has your show here changed as a result of the Trump presidency? A lot. I mean, I'm a real loud mouth. I can't, I can't help myself. According to WebMD, the symptoms of syphilis are Exhibit A, patchy hair loss. <laughs> Exhibit B, visual problems and squinting. Would you say you're on a mission to take him down? I would like to see him brought down, down to the ground, <laughs> preferably in handcuffs. I want him to be in prison. I think a lot of people want him to be in prison. Handler used her hour-long show to delve into divisive issues like DACA. These young people are the American dream. 91% of them are employed and 99% of them have no criminal record. That means they've never obstructed justice, colluded with Russia, defrauded people through a fake university, <laughs> bragged about sexual assault, or pardoned a racist maniac. So... In the end, Handler chose politics over late night. After a rocky two seasons... Don't you know when to stop filming? The comedian said she was ending her Netflix show to focus on activism. 
it's important to me to use my platform for good. A lot of people say, oh, I don't do politics. It's like, you don't have a choice now, okay? This is like, this is serious stuff. So we don't have a choice to opt out. Has Trump been good for the Chelsea Handlers of the world? I mean, in terms of comedy, like, oh God, you must have so much material. I, yeah, you can take the material. I don't want this kind of comedy, <laughs> no. Same goes for Anthony Atamina. We're gonna take people who are illegal immigrants and ship them to other countries. What do you think of that? No. What happens on the day President Trump's longer president? I'll probably put some stones in my pocket and walk out into the ocean. <laughs> no, I don't wanna do them anymore. A lot of people are saying that Trump wants our foreign policy to be good cop, bad cop. I think it's more like good cop, insane president. <laughs> There's no way anyone who comes after will ever take up as much ink on this show than we've already spilled on, uh, on President Trump. That is gonna be a fascinating thing to watch if, if it happens in four years or whenever it happens. They're gonna be like addicts that have to completely go cold turkey. I'm sorry, have you seen Donald Trump? If there's one thing he's never gonna get, it's a clean bill of health. There's never gonna be somebody like Trump again. I even thought, hey, maybe we won't talk about Donald Trump much tonight. And then he opened his mouth and all manner of stupid came out. <laughs> this is a one of a kind situation, both for the country and for the comedians. I have the power to destroy any country on earth, but I promise you, it'll be America first. <laughs> See you next week, Barbara. Everybody.